everyone, welcome back. And um, I thought today I would touch on a subject which is very close to my heart. It's played a massive role in my life. And so many of you have asked me about it and about my journey. So, the dreaded word, infertility. It's almost like menstruation. It happens to most or a lot of us, but no one wants to speak about it. It's that taboo subject, you know, like politics, sex and religion. It is like something you just don't talk about. And when it is spoken about, it is almost in a Hollywood type of scenario. So this month marks 10 years since we started our fertility journey. 10 years since my first miscarriage. And for the first time, can actually talk about it without an extreme and immense pain inside. So I thought, let me lay it out there for all of you. For those of you who are battling, for those of you who are considering fertility treatment, for those who have got kids and have got friends that are battling and just never have the answer or know what to say i'm going to break it down to you i'm going to give you a recount of my experience and also remember my experience is not everyone's experience but my experience is a lot of women's experience does my heartache make your heartache any less definitely not does one person's miscarriage rate higher than others because of when it was, how it was, what happened? Definitely not. Pain is pain and we all experience it in different ways. So let's rewind the clock to 2011. March 2011, we walked into a fertility clinic. I'm not going to name them because again, the outcome and how things panned out has got nothing to do with the clinic. It actually all has to do, believe it or not, with the man upstairs. And um, it's true what they say, that which should come to you will never pass you. And today I can sit here and I can say things happen for a reason. And Today I can sit here and I can say I'm so glad that our journey turned out the way it did because had it not, I wouldn't have been blessed with the beautiful little boy that we have in our lives now. Anyways, I regress. So March 2011, we walked into the fertility clinic and we had done a sperm sample to check motility, mobility, amount of sperm, healthiness around the sperm, all of that. Um, and then the doctor examined me. That was pretty traumatizing, I won't lie. Had an internal examination and I didn't know. Anyway, I'm not gonna get into that too much because I'm still trying to block out that memory. And when he scanned, he said to me, oh, look at that, you have got one egg in your ovary ready and you will be ovulating soon so let's start treatment so there's a couple of different fertility treatments not everything is IVF there's a couple of steps before you have to consider IVF and we did timed conception which is literally they give you an injection to induce ovulation you then have to do the deed between a certain time of the day for three days because that's your window period is 72 hours then you have artificial insemination which is literally they take the sperm they spin it 
they use like a turkey baster is what I call it but it's literally a speculum um, with a catheter almost like a pap smear scenario and then they inject that sperm directly into the uterus and then there is obviously IVF there's IVF with donor eggs there's IVF with your own eggs there's um, ICSI which I'm not going to chat about because we never did that and then of course there is surrogacy which is also via IVF obviously where there's surrogacy with um, so there's gestational and then there is the traditional surrogate so in South Africa we generally use gestational where we don't use the surrogates um, embryo or egg we use um, the commissioning parents which would be me and my hubby and um, so we would use those those like egg and sperm get an embryo and implant into the surrogate but I'm going to touch on all of that now so anyway we started our journey and um, we got the I got the injection and I had the injection we had to do the deed between 8 to 10 on the Sunday evening I remember and then the Monday was a public holiday and we had to go in for what they call a post coital test so you can't bath you can't shower and literally what they do is they take a swab almost pretty much like a pap smear again and they then put it under a microscope so if you have ever watched look who's talking um, with John Travolta and I think it's Kirsty Allen I think that's her name anyway where the sperm's like swimming towards the the egg and you're talking and all of that so it's pretty much like that so underneath the microscope they then look for motility of the sperm are they moving are they still alive um, are they moving fast all of that generally if they are dead it means that you've got a hostile cervical mucus which in my case for once my cervix is less hostile than i am winner so we got the the green light and the doctor said to us you know now it's just we just have to wait and see and lo and behold i felt pregnant and i remember not feeling so great and my cousin said to me maybe you're pregnant and i was like oh, whatever like no one feels pregnant for the first time and i, I don't want to get my hopes up but i mean like you do have your hopes up and i went to two clicks and i bought one of those pregnancy tests and um, I peed on it, you know, and I um, left it. And I actually forgot about it. And like about 20 minutes later, I was like, oh, pregnancy test. And hubby was away on project. And I remember we still had Blackberry and I sent him a picture of it. And then I phoned him and I was like, you didn't answer my message. And I said to him, just check your messages. And he phoned me back and he was like, no fucking ways. That was his response. And we were over the moon. And um, we told everyone. Rookie era. Because suddenly, like, all these people knew. And we were so excited about it. And um, three days later, I miscarried. And uh, I still remember we had been watching Grey's Anatomy and it's that episode where Kelly and Arizona were pregnant and um, when the bleeding started and, and all of that stuff he said to me maybe it's just like on Grey's you know maybe it's like it's, it's, it's not really a miscarriage and, and all of that but my gut told me that things hadn't worked out the way that we had planned and you know it's so funny when you when you find out you're pregnant whether it's one day whether it's two weeks ten weeks five months you you make all these plans for this little being you wonder if it's a girl or boy you start thinking about rooms about names about where they're gonna go to school about university I mean, you plan this whole little human's life before they are even young. 
and um, it was the first time in life that I experienced heartache so close to me and it, it you know I, I questioned everything did I do something wrong was I not healthy enough um, you know maybe I was a little bit too overweight Maybe the fact that I had polycystic ovary syndrome, you know, was the issue. Maybe, um, you know, maybe I wasn't ready to be a mom. I mean, I had people in my camp told me that it was God's way to tell me that I just wasn't quite ready. And um, when I look back now, I think, sure, all I needed from you was a, uh, I know this sucks, but you'll get through this as well. And I think this is where people make the mistake. They, they want to give you that tidbit of, you know, everything happens with a reason. And that's not what you want to hear when you're sitting there. When you're sitting there, you just, you just want a hug and a shoulder to cry on and copious amounts of alcohol and chocolate <laughs> to drown your sorrows in, which I couldn't do because I was trying to fall pregnant. So anyway, um, I thought I was over this, but apparently not. Um, after the miscarriage, the doctor was like, well, the highlight of this is we know you can fall pregnant. Woohoo! Now it's just a case of trying to figure out how to keep the pregnancy going. So blood tests showed that my progesterone was very low and obviously progesterone is needed to thicken the lining of the uterus and all those things. So I then had to have a hysterologram, which is really not exciting. So I'm allergic to iodine, which meant I had to be prepped with cortisone before. And literally what they do is they do a contrast where they inject dye through a catheter into your uterus and they then check the housing to see if it's all okay and um, it was fine the tubes were open the ovaries looked fine the uterus looked fine as the doctor said there's no reason why you shouldn't fall pregnant again so anyone who knows me would know that I'm a real type A personality and I don't fail at anything. So this became an obsession with me. And I went back month in, month out, month in, month out, 12 times for timed conception to be exact. Um, during that I had another five miscarriages which I shared with no one because I just felt, you know, I just didn't feel the need for the pity, for the, oh, don't worry, your time will come, or, you know, you should just relax and it'll happen, or you should go on a holiday. Well, newsflash, we're spending all our money on fertility treatment. There wasn't really much left to do holidays. So at the end of 2011, I told hubby that, or I should say in the beginning of 2012, I said to him, you know what, we, we need to take a break. My body is shattered. My mental health is nowhere. I, I mean, I fought a woman in Woolworths over freaking yogurt because I was so high on hormones. And um, like, you know, what the hell? So, I, we took a break and um, I changed doctors at the clinic that I was at and um, the new doctor said to me, well, why haven't you guys done IVF? And I thought, Jesus, really? We've spent about a hundred grand already and now you ask me, like, why have you guys not suggested it? But anyway, it is what it is. So. Then I proceeded and I asked the question and I said to the doctor, you know, we have tested everything. You've done, you've checked the housing, you've done the sperm. 
can you check the eggs? And he was like, well, yeah, it's a blood test. It's quite expensive though. And I thought, no, you're 100K in. How much? 10,000 Rand for blood tests to check if there's any genetic problem. Really? Well, we're gonna now really start talking about money. And um, I then had a blood test to check for chromosomal issues. And um, I mean, there's nothing in our family, nothing. And when he phoned me with the results, he was stunned. And he said to me, you know, he hasn't seen that in all these years of practice. And I have a chromosomal problem called reciprocal reallocation. So what happens is that the way chromosomes look is you've got, um, so you've got 23 and your partner's got 23 and then they, they bind. So you have a short leg and a long leg. And what happened to mine is that a piece of the long leg, a piece of the short leg on one chromosome would break off and go and allocate, reallocate itself on another chromosome. And this would lead to abnormality, obviously. And your body's way of responding to abnormality is miscarriage. So we figured out that if I managed to carry, generally it would turn into miscarriage with my own eggs. Um, if I managed to, to carry through um, to term, the baby would probably be born with some form of defect and um, it wouldn't survive for a period, you know, past a certain age. So this all happened, all this news came to me while we had just done one artificial insemination, which came back negative. And um, I was then faced with the idea of having to use donor eggs. And um, I remember the doctor saying to me that motherhood doesn't have to be blood. It, it doesn't have to be your genetic for you to be a mom and I battled I won't lie I battled and I think my hubby battled with it as well but we sort of came to terms and we were like it's fine because you know we're going to have half of him and how donor works is it's completely anonymous you choose from baby photos and um, I, I mean, I've got this list of people that I went through and um, we got a donor and our first two IVFs with a donor didn't work. And then I changed clinics, mainly because I felt I needed a fresh eye. Um, I had a lot of side effects from all the medication progesterone and oil injections that caused like my bum muscle to just about rot. Um, it was like I had a lot of stuff happen and I just felt I needed a, a new fresh approach. So we then went to a new clinic and um, the doctor was amazing. And at the previous clinic you would go on the second day of your period for an internal ultrasound and then you would keep on going for more ultrasounds and stuff and it was the most horrific and horrifying experience I'm, I'm a very private person when it comes to things like that and um, yeah like having someone shove this thing up your hoo-ha during that time of the month is I want to say degrading and you lose all your dignity it, it really goes out the window so at the new clinic he was like no I don't do that <laughs> so I was like oh my god 
and the approach was completely different to the first clinic. And I had all these high hopes once again and we got another um, new egg donor and we tried three times. And at my third time that I went for the implantation, I, I was I was besides myself. And um, I remember him saying, Mrs. Kulin, you must believe, and you must pray to whoever you pray to, but you must believe that you deserve to be a mom. And I thought, wow, <laughs> you think I'm doing all this because I don't believe I deserve to be a mother? And it was really hard hitting and difficult to hear. And you know, you watch these movies, and they walk in and they do fertility and they walk out and, they, and they're pregnant. And I was now 17 times around the block. A good, I don't know, 500,000 rand in. And we still had nothing to show for it. And, um, I mean, you know, it was probably more money, but that's besides the point. Because when people would say, you know, once the baby's here, yeah, the money wouldn't matter. <laughs> the money matters when the baby doesn't come. And um, everything suffers. Your relationship, your marriage, your relationship with friends, everything. I mean, friends were so scared to tell me that they were pregnant because for some other reason, I obviously seem like some crazy person who's going to want to cut open your belly and steal out your unborn fetus. When what they don't realize is that, in fact, knowing how hard it is, I'm actually so ecstatic for anyone who falls pregnant. And I'm really overjoyed when it does happen because the doctor said to me once, there's 200 things that need to go right for you to fall pregnant and only one to go wrong for to miscarry. And it's so scary. It really is a miracle when it happens. And a lot of people I know don't have the faith or don't believe or whatever. But um, this definitely isn't in our power. And I was angry, I was angry at everyone. I was angry at the doctors, at the clinic, at God, at, at you name it. If you looked at me in the wrong direction. I was angry and I was a very horrible person during that time. And um, we took a break. And during that break, a friend of mine from New Zealand came out. And she said to me, I'll be your surrogate. And um, I mean, she was amazing and she was like, you know, we've seen how, how amazing you guys are with other people's children and we want to give that to you. And I, I was stumped and um, we went, I, I, I started researching a little bit more about it and we found an attorney who deals with surrogacy law because it's not just a case of, hey, I'll be your surrogate. Hey, we implant the embryo. Hey, here's your baby. If only. So, firstly, we went to see Robin. Uh, she specializes in surrogacy law. And um, we went to see her and it actually is massively complex. So, we couldn't use my friend from New Zealand because there's no um, treaty or whatever between... New Zealand and South Africa and in New Zealand the surrogate the baby is still registered in the surrogate's name and then the commissioning parents have to legally adopt and South Africans can't adopt through there and it, it's just like it, it was just completely like cool. so we left it at that and um, but I then got the explanation of how it works so you get a surrogate 
and uh, they get assessed by a psychologist to see whether they are crazy literally it's, it's literally that whether they will be okay with carrying someone's baby and handing them over the surrogates in south africa don't get paid you get paid an amount to cover costs like living costs and that sort of thing um you know sort of i would say it's almost as a payment for inconveniencing you um as commissioning parents we have to take out life insurance we have to put it on the medical aid we pay for all the treatments um all of that okay once she's cleared by the gynae as well or the the fertility specialist as well as um the psychologist we as commissioning parents also go through a grueling like three hour psychological examination to check what everything is like how we are are we will we cope with someone else carrying our baby and it was hard for me i'll be honest because i mean i'm so ocd about certain things and thinking about letting some woman carry my child you know it's hectic and then there was a facilitator at the clinic that would help us match and she matched us with a few people who i'm sorry to say i wouldn't even let these women carry my handbag let alone my baby nothing against them it's just your gut feel tells you whether it's a right fit or not and um the one turned out that her fiance, husband, whatever, had actually taken the, the, um, the questionnaire anonymously, whatever, and then turned out that he's a complete narcissistic psychopath. He also had all these things outstanding um, against his, on his police clearance. So I was like, whoa, not happening. Then the other lady that came on, closer it got to time, she realized that she couldn't actually do it and I respected her for that and then um, we found someone through a friend and she was perfect and um, we went through everything and it was the day after my grandfather's funeral that we actually implanted and we had so just to give you an idea again we did embryos we did egg donor and then then we sent all of those embryos off to be tested genetically tested so we put a 20,000 rand deposit down and then it's 4,000 rand per embryo to be tested okay and like they take a piece off and, and whatever and out of the lot that we sent the first time there were three we had three that survived and we could even know the sex. So we had two boys and a girl. And I was super excited. And I've always wanted a little boy. And I thought, you know, we're paying so much money. And I know a lot of people will disagree. But when you're sitting in that, you might as well just choose what you want, right? Maybe that's where we went wrong. Anyway. So we chose and we implanted a little boy and we only, we decided to implant only one because at a time, because we only had three chances with the surrogate. So once you've done all the um, paperwork, it gets sent to the high court and the high court decides whether you can go ahead or not. And with that high court order, the surrogate, um, relinquishes all rights to the baby so we had what you call a gestational surrogate so the embryo was not any didn't have any of her dna it was not genetically linked to her at all it was hubby's sperm and a donor egg so we implanted this little boy and um, on my dad's birthday i found out that she was pregnant and the HCG count was so high and the doctor came in and he said to me, congratulations, it's probably twins. And oh, I was so excited. And Johan was so excited. It was just absolutely amazing. And um, 
we were going to tell everyone on Mother's Day. And something in me said, just, just hold back until you have that first scan. And we were supposed to have the scan on the 16th of May, 2017. And um, she called me and she said, sorry, I've got fluid food poisoning. I can't have the scan today. Okay, cool, let's go tomorrow. Oh no, tomorrow doesn't work for me. You know, we've got an agreement but at that stage I just wanted to be nice <laughs> I didn't want to rock the boat and, and hold to it and the Thursday she still hadn't gone for the scan and she um, phoned me I was having coffee with a friend and she phoned me and she said I'm so sorry I'm crying and I started bleeding this morning and I've miscarried phone the fertility clinic and they cocked on me from a dizzy height. This is not how it works. She can't go to her own guy and she's supposed to come in. If it was twins, maybe the other one has still survived. Da -da -da, and all this stuff. And I was like, why are you shouting at me? <laughs> I'm just a messenger. And my friend said to me, you know that this was your babies. And then it dawned on me. And um it hit me hard and a lot of things happened and I'd spoken to the attorney and we think, I don't have proof, but we think that she terminated the pregnancy. She neither denied nor confessed to it. That for two and a half weeks, three weeks actually, she wouldn't go for a scan or anything. Where she told me in message that she had been for a scan and um, all this stuff. And um, once she would, did finally go, because I said, you know, we, we sent her lawyers letters saying you're bound by contract, by all of that stuff. Um, she said to the doctor she never had any medical intervention, which completely goes against what she told me, and I've got the messages. But anyway, so that was that, and um, we were back to the drawing board. And then my cousin came for and she's got three boys of her own, and literally, I mean, her husband looks at her and she falls pregnant. And uh, she had mentioned being a surrogate a couple of years ago, and then she found out six weeks later that she was pregnant with her last born. And she was so devastated because she felt like she had promised it to me. And I was too scared to approach her, and she was too scared to say to me, hey, but somehow we closed the communication gap and she stepped up and we implanted and the first time she was convinced that she was pregnant and I mean I've dealt with this so many times that for me it was like the second nature for it not to work and um we did the test and she was and it was negative And I realized the trauma dealing with the devastation that she was going through was 10 times worse. So we tried again. Our last one was with a little girl, and it also didn't work. And um, then we took a break. That was in the November of 2017. And in February 2018, we had one embryo left and we were going to implant and it didn't make it out the gates. And I 
decided that that was where this journey ended. I wasn't meant to be a mom, obviously, and it was time for me to accept my, the cards that I'd been dealt. So I went completely apeshit crazy and I entered Mrs. South Africa. And you know, so many people asked me why. And so many people, because I'm not a pageant person at all, I can hardly walk in heels. And this is as dolled up as you probably would see me. And I wanted to feel, I suppose, better about myself. I wanted to feel like there was more to me than a dull the physio, a dull the Johan's wife, a dull the daughter, a dull the person who can't have a baby. And I wanted to speak up for women like me, women who battle to fall pregnant, women who have miscarried, women who have had a rainbow baby after, um, women who choose not to have babies because that's also okay, women who use IVF, women who don't, um, women who pop them out so easily, women who are single parents, married, divorced, you know, whichever way that you work. And I just want to speak up for them. And I wanted to just be a little bit of a breath of fresh air to say, hey, you might come out, you know, a little bit batshit crazy, but you'll come out okay. You will, you'll survive. And I, I started a campaign called I Am Enough. And I, for the first time in my life, I actually believed that I was. And I had a beautiful nephew who I was like a second mom to. And it was absolutely amazing. And um, 2018 flew past and then 2019 came and I met a wonderful woman. Um, she had heard me speak. She was one of the contestants and she had heard me speak and she shared her story with me she then told me about this children's home that she worked at and that she was affiliated to and these little boys and somehow adoption came onto the radar and hadn't been there for a very long time and when I saw Desmond's photo for the first time wow it was as if this little boy was made just for me and you know they say not in your time in God's time and I'm not a big religious person but um, yeah <laughs> I guess it was our time and um, this little guy was just amazing and then my sister went through the trauma of a miscarriage as well. And it's something that I never wish on anyone. And I wish I could take her hurt away. And it was so devastating for me to watch someone so close experience that same anguish and that and it go through those same things of questioning. And I remember saying to her, nothing you did was wrong. And then they packed up and they moved to New Zealand. They took my heart with them. And in that time frame, I realized that it was time for us to really live our lives. And we put it to put the ball rolling to foster this little boy that we have with us now and that is a that is a story for a different day because that is like red tape and we're currently busy with his adoption but I can
and I'll tell you how thankful I am every day for that journey that I walked and that it didn't work. Sounds insane, right? But I'm glad it didn't work because our life is so fulfilled with the most beautiful little boy who would otherwise probably not have gotten what he's getting now. Maybe he would have, but I don't know. So not everyone's story is like mine, but mine's got a happy ending regardless. I spent over a million rand. I went through 23 failed attempts, that includes the surrogacy, IVFs, artificial insemination, time conception, 83 internal ultrasounds, and emotional trauma like I can't tell you. A marriage that hung on by a thread and I'm so thankful for my husband because we, I always say, it's okay when you're standing at the cliff by yourself. So when you're facing like turbulent times in your marriage, as long as one person still wants to try, you know, it's great. It's when both people want to give up. And luckily we were never at that stage where we both wanted to give up. And, um, for that, I'm very thankful for him. I resented him for a long time because I felt like he pushed and wanted this. But I also didn't say no. But in the same breath, you know, you will do whatever it takes to make your partner happy. And for me, it was trying everything under the sun because I never ever wanted anyone to turn around and say that I didn't try. It was only later that we found out that I've got an autoimmune disorder which actually stops my uterine lining from thickening. So I would never have been able to carry a baby. And you know, if I'm completely honest, I've never wanted to be pregnant, I just wanted to be a mom. Ridiculous, right? But you do what you want to do and you do what you got to do. And what I want to say to all the women out there, you know, everything in life has an expiry date. And your fertility has the biggest sell-by date. And I got married very late. I was already 28 and we were like, yeah, we'll start our family in five years and I'm full pregnant at 32 and this next one at 35 and I had this whole map, this thing planned out. And then we decided to do it earlier. Thank God we did because else I would have still been sitting here now going through all of this. And the thing is just, you unfortunately are most fertile between 24 and 28 young eggs <laughs> say what you want and your fertility decreases as you get older i am a firm believer that stress and all of that also impacts on the the chances of falling pregnant and you're never out of the woods until that baby is in fact born and everyone says oh for the first 12 weeks keep it quiet and then you are share Share the joy, because if it turns into disaster, you need your people to pick you up, to wipe away the tears and to hold you close and bring you chocolate and wine. <laughs> and um, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to do whatever you have to, if you want to be a mom. Don't be afraid to say, I don't want kids. 
don't be afraid to do what you need to do to get your end game, your end goal. And I can honestly say, would I do it all again? I guess so, because there was always that chance. But in the same breath, there are so many children out there that deserve a home, that deserve a family, that need parents. And if you are sitting in a boat where pregnancy is failing you and you really want to be a mom and you want to be parents, adoption is so amazing and it doesn't have to be blood for you to love the little person. They just want love. They want love, they want stability, they want to know that they belong. So that's that. That's the journey. Also, I think women who are still single, who are navigating their careers and all of that, freeze your eggs. Freeze your eggs because you don't know what's going to happen. And 28 year old eggs are so much bigger, better than. 35 year old eggs ask me I know if you're going for fertility ask the questions I feel like fertility treatment should have the the, the a big component of it they should test the eggs from the word go I, I never understood why that wasn't a, a routine check because it could save you so much money heartache disappointment um, and can just set everything in motion quicker and better. So, in saying that, motherhood truly is the best hood, apparently. It's crazy, it's amazing, it's, it's fantastic. And however you get there, it doesn't matter. It's the journey that counts. And remember, your challenges do not define you. They shape you into the person that you are. So, my scars run deep. I realized how deep when I went to the guy need. <laughs> and it's okay to talk about it. It's not a taboo subject. Because the more people talk about it, the more we can help each other. That's it for me. Hope I didn't ramble too much. Hope you learned something from this video. And um, have a wonderful day.